fashioning ex magazine speaking edition. Like many people, I often have to work alone without enough support or any tangible form of community. And having the resource of Haymarket's platform to host critical conversations on the left is so meaningful. I know I have relied on Haymarket to keep up with the organizing and scholarship around the border, movement histories, labor organizing, and the global south. And I mean, honestly, in a con context where the mainstream media is often wholly silent or dilutes the conversation beyond recognition, the importance of Haymarket is further underlined. Simultaneously, I recognize that there is no section on technology in the Haymarket books. This is not an indictment of Haymarket, rather it speaks to the disjuncture we find ourselves in in this present moment where digital technologies are converging with state violence to reorganize, reorganize society in service of supremacist political projects and finance capital. I truly hope that the Beacons edition, which is fully available, open access online at this time, shout out to Ben Tarnoff and Moira for making that happen and to UCLA C2I2 Center, Alongside this discussion with Sophia Noble and Dr. Timnit Gebru, as well as the event we did last month on Between the Black Radical Tradition and the Digital, featuring Zoe Samudzi and S.A. Smythe, can provide a launching point for organizers, scholars, and technologists to deepen their engagement with tech, carceral capitalism, and abolitionist movement building. To get us started, I wanted to read a brief excerpt of the editorial, a body of work that cannot be ignored. Also, special shout out to Sita Peña Gangarden from our data bodies who conceptualized that name. In June 1945, a committee chaired by the physicist James Frank raised the alarm about the Manhattan Project's development of nuclear weapons. The document they produced, known as the Frank Report, urged President Truman not to use the atomic bomb against Japan. Instead, Truman should demonstrate the bomb's destructive power by dropping it on a desert or a barren island, or he should try to keep the bomb's existence secret for as long as possible. Otherwise, the scientists warned, a global nuclear arms race would ensue, with catastrophic consequences to the planet. The authors of the Frank Report had worked on the Manhattan Project, but rather than siphon the scientific knowledge they had accrued in developing nuclear weapons out of the lab and into the commons in order to build a mass movement, they waited until the final hour to pen a letter addressed to a government that would never heed their call. The scientists understood the stakes of nuclear weapons better than anyone, but in making a moral appeal to the American empire, they demonstrated a profound misunderstanding of the social and political context the technology was developed in service of. Two months later, after, two months after they wrote the report, atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It was in this history, it was this history that came to mind in the wake of Dr. Temnik Gebru's high profile firing from Google in the winter of 2020. I was deeply appreciative to see the groundswell of support from across the field in support of Timnit, but also felt deep anxiety about relying on an open letter to Google as the political mechanism to affect change, given the stakes that we face with the development of global carceral technologies. In the interview with Sophia and Meredith Whitaker holding to account, I asked a series of questions like, so we're facing these tremendous stakes and also have to contend with the civility politics you both alluded to. How do we negotiate the obvious villains of centralized corporate computing capital while also uh, this negotiation among ourselves? Who is the resistance? How do we identify what that means? What does the coalition look like and how do we start thinking about some of those bright lines? It's in this spirit that the event is framed around transformative justice and knowledge production in tech. I wanna be transparent that I'm by no means an expert on transformative justice, justice practices but have learned and continue to engage with the work from people like Mariam Kaba, Andrea Ricci, Leia Lakshmi, um, so sorry, I'm gonna mess up your last name, Pipsna uh, Samarisna. I'm super thankful to the Barnard Center for Research for Women who has, ha who has a series of accessible videos on their website on accountability, everyday transformative justice practices and building community on their website. And so with that, I would like to introduce our two esteemed guests. Dr. Sophia Unobel is an internet study scholar and professor of gender studies and African American studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, where she serves as the co-founder and co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. She holds affiliations in the School of Education and Information Studies and is a research associate at the Oxford Institute at the University of Oxford, where she is the commissioner on the Oxford Commission on AI and Good Governance. Um, she's, of course, uh, recognized him as a MacArthur Foundation Fellow and is the author of Algorithmic Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. 
And Timnit Gebru is the founder and director of the Distributed Artificial Intelligence Research Institute. Prior to that, she was fired by Google in December 2020 for raising issues of discrimination in the workplace, where she was serving as co-lead of the ethical AI research team. She received her PhD from Stanford University and did a postdoc at Microsoft Research, New York City in the Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics in AI group, where she studied algorithmic bias and the ethical implications underlying projects aiming to gain insights from data. And so with that, I thought we could open um, first with uh, Dr. Noble and then with Dr. Gebru and then we'll open up for questions. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Khadija, for the invitation to be in conversation with you and Dr. Gebru. You know that I am super fans of the two of you and all, you know, all the work that you both do to contribute to building community and making space for these very important conversations. Um, let me just start by saying that it's so rare that we get to have a conversation that is led by black women. And I wanna underscore the need for more of these kinds of conversations and more space for um, our thoughts, our ruminations, our building solidarities, um, both among ourselves and with other communities and with other people in our field. Because um, what I, when I look out at the field and the kind of work that we're doing, I think there's still so much space for um, transformative justice just in this in the making of space for Black women to participate in this field and to participate in um, shaping it and leading it. Um, maybe I'll start a little bit with kind of my own journey and that brought us to this conversation because, uh, you know, I went to graduate school later in life, um, in my late 30s. I got a PhD when I was 41. And um, at the time that I was entering the um, field, I was trying to think about things like um, the way in which race and gender were so profoundly distorted, misunderstood, um, erased, um, unwilling to be contended with and negotiated with around people who were thinking about the internet or thinking about software or thinking about hardware. And um, it's amazing that 10 years later, we have uh, a whole field of critical race and digital studies that's emerging. We have people who are working both as computer scientists and um, all kinds of engineers, robotics, um, uh, you know, um, humanists, social scientists, people who are inside the academy and outside. In fact, people who are community organizers who are helping us understand some of the most important ways that technology is touching our communities in harmful um, carceral ways. So we have a lot of people now, I think, thinking about issues of justice and repair. And um, that's a big, big sea change, I will say, um, from a decade plus ago, which Khadija, to your opening remarks, um, really, I think, was a state of affairs around the digital and the internet, which was thinking simply of technology as a tool, as apolitical, as um, without values, without consequences, as neutral, as um, only being political, like the way that um, scientists who worked on the atomic weapons thought of their work as pure science or basic research, um, and that the decisions about how to use that science would be left to politicians. Um, I think that the fields of computing and um, social science um, inquiries into computing have also been treated similarly. Um, that regulators or other types of policymakers need to be thinking about the consequences of that work and that the technologists themselves have no accountability and no responsibility to think about the politics of their work. We certainly see in other um, very, very important issue areas in society right now, like the environment and global warming and issues of sustainability for the planet and for human beings and the earth and all of its inhabitants, um, that climate scientists, for example, are saying things like, uh, we did the science, we made apparent the harms 
that were coming from the way in which human beings are living. And we gave the reports over to policymakers and we assumed that they would act responsibly with that. And they did not see themselves as activists. And in fact, only recently have become activists in their orientation to talking about global warming. So I think of this space that we're in as um, um, absolutely requiring an activist stance as we see more and more convergence, to your point, of these technologies in um, um, producing decisions and circumstances that remove so much or invalidate or nullify so much of our humanity. And I think the places where we see that nullification of our humanity um, practiced and perfected is on Black people around the world, uh, on oppressed people, on women, um, on LGBTQIA plus communities. Um, these pockets and spaces and places around the world are the places where so many technologies are beta tested, are tried out, are perfected before they're kind of rolled out in mass. And those are the kinds of things that I think the three of us look at and care about. Um, and um, it doesn't surprise me because I will say that in my own journey, when I first started looking at something which is like seemingly banal to me, I mean, looking at Google search results um, seems like a kind of boring exercise probably to many people. Um, but finding over and over again, the kinds of racist and sexist disinformation, propaganda, um, content, whatever words get used and deployed in different ways by different people. Um, you know, when I was sounding the alarm about that, that, you know, why is it that pornography is the primary way in which women of color and girls of color in the United States are, are misrepresented? And of course, if we have so little agency in speaking back to that um, and making those systems change, uh, you know, people felt, they were like, oh, I feel sorry for the black girls. Ugh. You know, I mean, nobody really cared. They really didn't empathize either. Um, they were kind of uh, often engaging with that research like it was novel. And, um, you know, in some cases, in some places, people would argue with me at uh, conferences and say, uh, well, you know, maybe it's because black girls do more pornography, right? Or do more porn. And that's why we're represented pornographically um, and not, you know, unwilling to question that the companies themselves and the advertisers and the industries were profiting off of the exploitation of black women and girls. And that in fact, they were printing, um, you know, what we've come to find uh, to be trillions of dollars off of racist propaganda against um, communities of color, you know, a decade later. So I think where these, um, you know, where these issues extend to me are that it's often black women and women of color and marginalized people who see the harm as it's affected against our communities. And um, as we call out for different kinds of support and solidarity and transformation of these systems in the ways that they harm our communities, um, we're often met, quite frankly, with silence um, until those phenomena impact you know, mainstream societies, or let's say people in power, people with power. And of course, one of the things that I found so interesting in my work over the years was that the same logics that distorted black women and women of color, girls of color on the internet, were the same logics, let's say, that distorted um, political electoral politics, and gave rise to the, you know, far right, um, authoritarian regime being elected in 2016 in the United States. Um, in fact, we see those same kinds of logics deployed in other parts of the world, too, right now. And um, this, to me, is one of the reasons why um, looking to the spaces and places where um, um, many of us are working and the concerns that we have are so incredibly important. And to me, this is where your work has been so important um, for many of us, you know, as you sound the alarm about things like new product development at Google being incredibly um, um, impactful on societies and the environment um, uh, that 
your voice and your team's voices and that work can become disposable, right? That it can actually just be erased and obliterated because it is contrary to the primary goal, which is profit at all at all cost um, by many of these corporations. And the thing we should add is that it's not just kind of a Wall Street issue about uh, return to shareholders at all cost, because many of the companies that we are also talking about work and function as kind of the um, de facto arms of the state around the world to um, surveil publics and communities to um, control the movement of um, various people, whether it's crossing borders or having access to resources, having access to just basic quality of life needs. Um, these kinds of, um, as you mentioned, Khadija, these kinds of technologies that we study, I think, are becoming so ubiquitous through multiple industries with many different kinds of stakeholders benefiting from their deployment and millions of people around the world um, paying um, a very, very high price for that. So um, I'm really interested in being a part of this conversation with the two of you today, because when I think about applying these models of transformative justice, um, uh, that means we have to really um, apprehend the status quo as it's currently operating. We have to redirect material resources into other kinds of alternative possibilities. Um, and we have to really reframe the questions and the conversations that I think are um, uh, driving us in the wrong direction in so many different ways. And so maybe I'll just leave it there and just say that this is kind of the, the orientation that I'm bringing to this conversation today. And I'm really excited to be in conversation with the two of you. Um, I love going second <laughs> because I, I can just take notes based on what you said and I can, um, so, you know, I have to say it's really interesting. Every time, um, I, uh, we appear together, we have this conversation. So if, yeah, I don't think people understand how optimistic you are. I mean, I don't know, to me, like you, you know, it just seem I, you know, I remember like last time you said, you know, we have to remember all of these people who changed the world, like the abolitionists, it was a few people. I, I still remember that. And I'm like, that is completely different from how I view things, right? I, I, I was thinking about things. I was thinking about things more like, oh man, we need all, so many people to affect this little change. And then you were reminding us that actually, you know, and then, um, kind of remembering how you were just saying like there's all these people talking about these issues now working with on these issues from different angles so i just wanted to say like i truly appreciate that because um you know i don't think i think people try to portray um um critical work like this as like the pessimists or the whatever and it's it's the complete opposite right it's 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 the people who actually are very optimistic about the ability for us to to completely change things you know and i and i really appreciate that but um <laughs> it's so you know when you were talking about the manhattan project khadija i was i was thinking oh man me and google and like and then you went to that because um you were talking about how they were appealing to the empire and how that was you know sort of misguided and i feel you know for a long time that's what i did you know when i was um when i was internally at google i spent you know, I did spend a lot of my time building coalitions because I, I did still see the value of, you know, when I'm being targeted, how to sort of build solidarity and coalition among other people. But I also spent so much of my time and energy appealing um, to people whose job kind of depends on not understanding, you know, on not, on not taking um, the right stand kind of thing. And I did that for a very long time. And um, I kind of, I uh, feel like I'm spending a little bit less of my time doing that now, you know, spending more on the coalition building side and less on the appealing to, you know, 
um, people who I just think it's when when I did, I feel like there were times when I was um, successful in spending all of that energy into changing like somebody's mind who has a lot of power. Right. And that did make a huge difference because that person can protect a lot of people, um, can advocate for them, etc. But um, it really is. Um, I agree with you that it is kind of more of a misguided uh, way of doing things. But I. I did um, spend a lot of my time doing that for a long time. And so you had this question of solidarity and coalition and who is the coalition? Who is the the um, resistance and how do we have different conversations around uh, these issues? You know, you, we don't have to have. I think, Safi, I remember you said this a while ago. We don't all have to agree on everything, but we also can't be just like monolithic. Right. And that because that's. Um, you know, then you can efficiently march towards the wrong thing. So this question of like how to, you know, I, I could I okay, I have a whole I have a whole uh, spiel about this. So um, <laughs> I, I'll tell you. So, you know, in physics, right, you think about um, what's efficient and unstable, right? So for if you look at lasers, lasers like the light, they are ex the most efficient source of light you can create, like the same color, like you know, all the photons going exactly in the same direction, but they're also the most unstable form of light, right? You have to do laser cooling, etc. You look at the most inefficient form of light is white light. It's the most every every photon going in different direction, every single spectrum kind of represented. And I sort of feel like <laughs> there's always this kind of trade off between efficiency and stability. If you're too efficient and you're just going and marching in the exactly the same direction, you're probably going to efficiently march in, you know, in a very unstable, you're going to create like instability in the world. And a lot of um, consolidation and technology and efficiency, this focus on efficiency, I think is doing exactly that. But anyways, that was just an aside. I got too excited to, to say that. But but when we're building, so that's one of the things I think about when we're building these coalitions, right? Because we don't all have to agree. We still want to move things forward in a certain way in the things that we agree on. Uh, but then as we're doing that, as we're negotiating, you know, what what should we do? Who's the resistance? Solidarity versus, you know, critique, etc. Then I also remember like there's this other side. Hate is the biggest uniter, right? That very efficiently march, marches on on that end. So those those are the things that kind of kind of I think about, right? Like, <laughs> um, so how do we do this? coalition building in a way that you know is is taking into account many different perspectives um and then but then there's also this other side that's extremely efficient because hate is the the biggest kind of uniter right um and um i cannot read the oh yes oh sorry this other uh, thing um i wrote down is um safia how you mentioned that you know a lot of technologists think that um decisions should be um, uh, left to politicians and not the technologists. But the interesting thing to me is it's not even that. So there's a lot of there's pushback at every level. So, for instance, uh, when we have um, these ethical reviews at these conferences, we said now papers should be also go undergo ethical reviews, right? So I, as a reviews, as a reviewer at an academic conference, I can reject a paper because I can say it's not novel. I can say it's like this, whatever. Why can't I say I have ethical concerns? It has to go through ethical reviews. Huge pushback for this. Huge pushback. So what what are some of the pushbacks? They're like, well, that's not my that's not you know people say that's not my expertise it's the expertise of other people to look into these things that's fine then why don't you give them the power then to to say this thing should not be built or this thing should be built that's also not okay right or if they say oh the politicians should make the decisions but then regulation is not okay because it's going to stifle um, innovation so i think where we are right now is is like it's not just that they say, oh, it's not our responsibility, right? We say this is not our responsibility. It's that we also say, the, OK, it's somebody else's responsibility, but we don't want to give them the power to to make those decisions as well. Um, and um, and then you also mentioned about being um, called uh, that we have to be activists. And I think this um, this is a very interesting thing to me because um, my uh, one of my colleagues, um, uh, 
Mahdi, El Mahdi, who uh, Khadija knows, um, he, you know, he's a huge tar um, he, he's a scientist, but he's also, he used to be a journalist and he's a target of uh, the Moroccan government. And because of that, by necessity, he's been studying disinformation um, and social media harms, etc. And one of the things he said was that it's really interesting and, 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 um, you know, he mentioned that a lot of people in the scientific community uh, say that I'm an activist and activism is super important. I would consider it an honor <laughs> to be to be an activist. But he talked about the way in which they say it. They say it in a in a way to try to discredit you. Right. So he gave an example of authoritarian governments, how when they're trying to distinguish between journalists that they want to target and journalists that they don't want to target, they'll say that's a journalist. That's an activist. So they do it to, to further target them because, you know, now it's OK um, to target those activists. So I found it interesting. I'm sorry, I just have a bunch of disjoint notes that I wanted to <laughs> say as you, you were talking. So I found um, that interesting. And by the way, um, your research on um, search results um, that you started, you know, I, I don't think people understand how much of a trailblazer you are, right? Because it's so much, it's very normal for us to talk about these issues now, but I can imagine once you, when you started talking about search um, and racism, you know, the kinds of, the, the way in which um, people like try to um, tell you that this wasn't a big problem. But let me tell you something, even that, so that issue, is just like even that issue is so huge right now. So, for instance, the query um, when I was at Google just a couple of years ago, somebody searched for college girls in Swahili. It was all porn, all pornographic results. College girls in English, they learned, oh, that query we shouldn't do. Co college girls in Swahili, all porn. So like the same exact topic, you know, so many years later, still an issue, right? But they don't have to fix that. They've moved on to like now there's like the next, you know, we, oh, we want to make search a Q&A question and answer thing, right? Like they're kind of moving on to the next thing without even having to address that. Um, and then finally, um, the final point I'll, I'll make is um, you talked about how um, you were met with silence, right? Uh, when you talk about uh, various communities and, until um, it reaches um, uh, the, the mainstream and how many of these technologies are um, uh, first experimented on on various groups. And refugees to me are like one of one of the biggest um, uh, groups that they um, experiment on. And this reminds me of some some um, observations that I made. Um, and so, for instance, um, uh, when we look at, you know, the use of these disinformation networks or how social media is used or transnational uh, repression or things like that, it just is so difficult to get anyone to care about it. Right. So Mahdi, for instance, you know, he's Moroccan. He's like been harassed for such a long time. And YouTube was one of the biggest issues. Facebook is um, Twitter is and literally like we, it was so difficult to get anyone to care in the US. They're like, well, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't even know how to explain it. Like you can see that it didn't, um, it, it, it just didn't touch people the way that you think it would. And, but when we look at all of these things, they're so related. For instance, the same networks that are involved in this Moroccan case will get involved in the Syrian case, will get involved in Ethiopia, in, in Tigray and Eritrean case, and then uh, now that the Russia and Ukraine is when everybody kind of like starts looking at it, right? Like now it's kind of getting close to home. And so ev every time we kind of ignore some topic because it's like far, far away over there, we end up, or Palestine, like a lot of these um, uh, bo US Mexico border um, drones and various other things that we see were, you know, tested on Palestinians <laughs> first, right? Exported from there. So it's, um, that's just kind of um, another observation I had. I have a lot more to say, but I'll just stop there <laughs> with my notes. <laughs> Thank you. Now, now you have me reading from my notes. <laughs> I really appreciate the commentary from both of you guys. I think people are also surprised when they find out that I'm an optimist, especially since I've spent so much of my adult life studying like family separation and like predictive risk modeling in the child welfare system. 
But on one hand, you see like the ongoingness of slavery and how they want to auction, commodify, and separate black life. But the other aspect that's like never told is so many children that are separated from their families run away and reunite. Um, and despite these ongoing campaigns to decimate like black kinship ties, yeah. we're still here. You know, despite their best efforts, we're still here. And the, I mean, this is almost like a religious sentiment, but I feel some, you know, that that's the miracle of possibility is like, despite the systematicness of state violence, we're still here. Um, and then to the question of like only a few or what does the political look like, I think you know, as a teenager, I like entered into the organized left and I was inducted into reading about Das Kapital and Karl Marx and, you know, kind of the communist socialist canon and thinking a lot about political economy and critical theory and post-structuralist Marxism. And so there's an aspect in tech. I'm like, hey, there's some people that talked about the political economy of this stuff. Let's think about financial financialization as it relates to computational infrastructure. On the other hand, the people who get that aspect don't understand what we're facing with technology. They don't understand that your book is not just about this corporation as racist, but it's a fundamental question about how do we access knowledge? What are the infrastructures that support that knowledge gathering? And like, what is the nature of truth? When we're talking about abolition, what would it mean to even abolish Google search? Like inherently, like, what does that mean? This is not as simple as like antitrust or a world without capitalism. What is, if we, if we socially, if we socialize kind of the means of producing that information globally, like what forms of classification are just, or do we just like jettison that whole thing as a concept? You know, I think that we're unclear, um, but there's like a point at which things, things need to merge. And so on one level, I do feel like we need some decentralization. It can't be just like a vanguard of a handful of us that run everything and like top down dictate. On the other yeah. hand, I think things can go in a lot of different directions. Like the political can look like policy. It can look like going to the house. It can look like, you know, hopefully one day anonymous uh, hacking into the student loan service and like wiping all of that and like getting rid of incarceration by spreading a virus for the software they upload onto those ankle bracelets. Just throwing that out there. Um, but I think the flip side, like the positive side of racism or specifically like anti-blackness and white supremacy, right, is you have this concept of the digital divide, which Andre Brock talks about a lot. And that like black people in black neighborhoods are a site of abjectness and that they just lack, you know, in Africa too, right? They just lack computers. And then we have to go save them and bring them technology. But of course, this is all a lie, right? And so people have been had a techno culture and you have people who live in these quote unquote red line neighborhoods who are making like full length feature films on TikTok with no like traditional film training that are doing incredible things. And we see in the favelas in Brazil, people are hacking, creating all types of satellite connections so they can illegally hook up internet and the lights. Like people have had their own hackathons and their own kind of social analysis instead of social relationships in which they can modify these technologies for their own purpose. And so, you know, one of the little possibilities that I see in white supremacy is they're so incapable of understanding us and seeing us as human that this actually provides an opportunity um, or like a latency period where we can then intervene. Um, that said, I wanted to ask you, so I think both of you are recognized for making unique contributions as individual scholars. Um, but then there's also this moment where you're running DARE, uh, Tim Nen, you're running C2I2, uh, Safia with, um, Sarah Roberts. And so what does it mean for you thinking about how to produce knowledge in this environment of incredible corporate capture and the university around technology too. So how are you thinking about this on a collective level and how are you navigating the funding questions um, given the constraints at this moment? Do you wanna go first? <laughs> My chest is tight, it's fine, I'll go first. Well, first of all, um, you know, all my work is dedicated to thinking about the future of knowledge. That actually is how I got into studying search because I was thinking about the way in which we know. How do we know what we know? And how is that transformed over time and through people and institutions and books and libraries and schools and universities and parents and ourselves, our own agency. That's the locus. Um, and 
working in a university and aspiring to work in a university, getting a PhD and becoming a professor for me was about stewarding the public good and the public, the possibilities for the public that everyone would have the space to be transformed into our highest possible good through access to knowledge and knowing and each other and different ways of thinking and knowing, especially that we're, that are not oppressive and that are rooted in love and that are rooted in um, possibility. I mean, that is another one of my keywords. And so trying to do that in a university, which is of course a corporation, um, it is also um, committed to other things besides that, um, is very difficult because you know, my work is also rooted in black studies and gender studies, which are fields that are marginal to the dominant um, hegemonic ways in which the university conceptualizes its, itself and what's meaningful in within its boundaries. Um, I'm also, of course, you know, we're in this conversation in a moment in history where everything STEM is better and everything humanities and social sciences is not considered particularly valuable. We are living in a moment where gender studies is being made illegal um, and being um, treated punitively. We know black studies has always been under threat and always been um, in the crosshairs. And of course, the anti-critical race theory movement that is, uh underway now is really an anti-black movement and a movement about abolishing ways of knowing that stem from um black legal legal scholarship let's say and other kinds of scholarship so it's in that context that we're trying to do things like create a space for other kinds of epistemologies for other ways of knowing and thinking about the world and of course, you know, I, again, I look at other kinds of fields like why is it that so many people want to invest in and major in things like environmental science or environmental studies? Well, because the world is on fire and we want to live in the world. You know, we want to live on Earth. Um, only a few people want to colonize Mars. It's not us. All right. So that's why we have fields like ethnic studies and gender studies because we want to imagine a world free from oppression we want to imagine what it might be like to um, live and grow and love on different terms and i think the reason we're most optimistic about that and why we keep struggling to find resources and and make space for like you know queering the university and the way in which it has um, traditionally functioned is because um here we are, the three of us, you know, we are the descendants of people who were enslaved or colonized or both and who believed in a different set of possibilities in the world. And that for me, of course, is what motivates and animates my own work is like, I can see into the future, a different kind of future. It's very difficult. um, And, you know, people who I think think of academics or people like us um, as kind of just like, I don't know, coasting or like, you know, being comfortable in these environments have no idea how uncomfortable we are made constantly. Um, You know, you're talking about 2% of all full professors in the United States are black women, 2%, you know, Um, I just joined that rank of professors. And um, at the same time, you know, it is incredibly difficult to raise money and resources to support graduate students, to support conferences, convenings, make space for the kinds of work. Um, it's impossible to get um, bills paid and invoices processed and people supported and hired um, in these institutions that really don't share the same set of commitments or the same sense of urgency, quite frankly, around the things that we are urgent about. Um, Nevertheless, we persist. We continue to um, make these appeals and we see, in fact, that not only have the appeals that we have been making about investing in, um, uh, you know, um, anti-racist, decolonizing theories and strategies uh, and ways of thinking about and knowing about the tax sector, we see in fact that those conversations have been captured now by law schools and engineering schools where, um, you know, the whole emergence of like a field of ethics 
in different kinds of computing and engineering fields and legal fields, it has become normalized and actually put in service of um, not doing anti-racist work or not doing <laughs> the kinds of things that emanate originally from us and thinkers like us and our fields um, and, and these histories. So I think that the challenge is to demand and continue to um, shine a light on the kinds of corporate corporate capture that happen both in academia and in corporations where people take our words and then, you know, they get hundreds of millions of dollars, quite frankly. Literally. Literally. That's, and, a, a, that's I, or, literal. <laughs> you know, barely getting a hundred thousand dollar check. I'm not kidding you. Like it's seriously, like that will support one graduate student for two years. And, you know, we have to beg and put a lot of hours into just getting that. So the, the, of course we know, like, that's our job. We're in this lane to raise these resources and to support people and to do exactly what you said, which I think our own politics are not about ourselves and enriching ourselves. It's about building and supporting different kinds of p possibilities. And I love to meet that, I mean, you already know I'm about to bite your whole example about the physics and the <laughs> white um, light. I mean, that just consider what you're gonna hear it in the world and you're gonna know I'm the one that is putting it out there. Yeah. <laughs> I will I will credit you for saying it. But you know, we are in that work right now of trying to, I think, um, create space for so many others. Um, and that, in fact, will be, uh, you know, that's the organizing work that's happening in our spaces. Yeah, I, I was going to say um, the I, I find that it, it becomes pick your poison kind of thing and you draw a line somewhere in terms of the funding question. Right. So I actually wrote about this an op it about this and it, it you know, what I first of all, I, I've always thought about my work as um, a collective in some way, like. Uh, when it when it has something to do with people, I I, ha I haven't thought about it as a, a just as an individual. So when I got when I got to Google from day one, I was fighting to have more black women. I was the first black woman to be a resource scientist. I'm like, we need to hire more black women, and they won't. They don't want to hire more more black women, and that already immediately made me a target. I, I I knew that HR people didn't like me. I knew I just knew like <laughs> I, I made enemies. Um, with many different people and so anyway so you know um in term there's there are supposed to be labor protections right when when you get fired obviously they're not strong enough and they're not you know like harsh enough or whatever but there's something right there's something there so now let's say now i'm raising my money for a research institute uh let's say i piss off a, po a, a potential funder and they can just go tell all their other friends or whatever and that's it and it's not just my job, it's everybody else's job. So do I, you know what I mean? Do I do that? And so, okay, like, let me go try to find another source of funding. Um, okay, am I gonna depend on these two year grants from foundations? What if they decide, you know, tomorrow, like I say the wrong thing, whatever, nope, sorry. Um, and then, you know, there's all these international development agencies that also have funding. And I'm like, oh man, do, do we want like my, <laughs> there's like, international development, you know what I mean? So at the same time, you're trying to like, I want to create a different uh, environment, a space where each person in the institute is not so stressed out about producing and making sure that the funders see what they're producing and all of that, right? So you want to, um, you know, end appropriately compensate people whose work, whose knowledge might not be legible um, to, to some other people, right? Like, so it's especially academics, right? So for instance, in like, you know, I were, I, I know a lot of refugee advocates who have a lot of knowledge um, on even social media and hate speech and whatever. They haven't published on it. They don't, you know, they don't like get the, the fame and, and fortune or whatever, but, but okay, I wanna, I wanna like, uh, you know, funnel resources to that person, let's say, or whatever. Um, and, but then you have to make their work and whatever you're doing legible in some way to the potential funders. And you have to, you know, figure out it's like, I, I mean, foundations are more like, you know, started by very problematic dead people or alive problematic people. So you're like, 
you know, I mean, like Eric Schmidt, 150 million or whatever. I just left Google and I'm, I'm going to ask money from Eric Schmidt now or Zuckerberg Chan. I don't know what um, Jeff Bezos, right? Like these are the people. Or I just learned that actually most of uh, uh, the philanthropy is by private donors is what I, I just learned recently. Like um, foundations and stuff are a small portion of it. Okay, so now I'm going to have to go like appeal to a rich person and figure out how to make them give me money. I mean, this is ridiculous, right? So I really want, I mean, as, as Safia knows, I really want us to figure out how we can generate our own revenue too. But at the same time, if we do that, um, we also need to make sure we're grounded in research, in long-term research that might not generate revenue, right? But um, this is this is something that's very much on my mind right now. Yeah, it's really interesting because I'm, you know, I'm thinking like we wouldn't have a center at UCLA if it hadn't been for a handful of foundations who took the risk and supported. I mean, the, the first foundation we that supported us was Midaru in Australia. And here, you know, this is like, again, this idea that um, are you in the bullseye of the things that wealthy people care about and of course you you have to have one to say yes before anyone else will say yes um and in the university and i know in dare too we want the freedom the intellectual freedom to not be constrained by the desires of the funder who want maybe particular outcomes in the world that's really not our project um is to like execute on their agenda, agenda as much yeah. as to just inquire and of course when you're looking at some of the most vulnerable people in the world um or the most harmful kinds of technology design um you know that doesn't sound very sexy to a lot of people they're not necessarily interested in that unless you know they can um you know turn it into like a, a you know a like a poverty pimped kind of you know, orientation, right, to the work. And of course, we reject that too. So I think the terms upon which um, funders do their work is really, you know, they also need to be uh, asking themselves some hard questions about the people they cherry pick to fund and really the people they don't. And I've watched, I'll tell you, the one thing that's been so interesting um, after being granted a MacArthur Fellowship is that you, you know, you think of that. Genius, let's as, call it a genius award. Yeah, <laughs> think of that as being like that people are like ready to line up and get down with whatever that person is wanting to do. And in some ways, maybe, you know, like they definitely want to talk to you, but it doesn't really necessarily mean that they want to invest in you. And one of the things that I have really realized as I make these appeals is that, um, People don't want to invest in black people in particular and black women when it's about building our power. They yeah. love to give to us when we are like on welfare, when we're falling through the cracks, when we are like in survival mode, because it actually bolsters their own white supremacy. It makes them feel good. They did. They helped a poor person. You know, that is actually the entire psyche of giving in the United States, at least. And when we're saying like, oh, actually, there's this powerful woman named Timnit who is building a really powerful organization, then it's like crickets, do you know? And I, I find that to be the really, um, you know, the interesting um, uh, paradox is that people who are trying to build power in communities, that is actually, you know, not interesting to be supported. And of course, this is no surprise to us this should be no surprise. It isn't a surprise. This is actually par for the course. And this is one of the reasons why we also have to reject in our own intellectual scholar, um, scientific communities, this kinds of narrative of exceptionalism, you know, that this person is the person and everybody yeah. should be behind them. Because that is, I mean, I think the two of us could really bear witness to the fact that that is a farce. It's a fallacy. It's actually a dangerous yeah. fallacy too. What we need is to see the community organizations, the people who are affected by the kinds of things that we study, um, we need to help them strengthen their work. We are a part of that work with them. Um, and that's different than like enriching oneself personally, um, you know, around these concerns. And I think that 
you know, that's work that we also have to do. And I think about all this, like this conversation, I mean, I can't realize my chest is so tight because it stresses me out because our peers do not ever have to think about this. Because Look. they're a development director. It's, <laughs> first, it's just like getting Eric Schmidt to write them a check yeah. or whoever, you know. I mean, they just, they get to like put out lots of work that can get taken up in the world while we are truly figuring out how to make sure people's rent gets paid so they can do their work. And it's just a completely different set of circumstances and realities. Just yesterday, I found out about another institute um, and I wrote down their mission. It's to, I, I, I mean, I bet they're not watching. So I'm going to say, I, I don't remember the name. The mission is to do the most possible good in the world the mo- as efficiently as possible. The most efficient, you know, do the most possible good good in the world as efficient as efficiently as possible something like that so the area of focus artificial general intelligence agi longevity studying longevity uh and then something else that i don't remember apparently they have a 50 million dollar endowment why where are the receipts what did they do before besides the fact that they're white men like i don't know anything else I found out just in, <laughs> before that, I found out about another <laughs> institute. It's like $120 you know, million or something or the other, right? Super easy. And they're not visible, right? Like uh, we're, you know, for me, like I'm, and you're hyper visible too, right? Like, and part of it is, you know, um, I would love to not be visible and just do my work in the background. And there's the money's there, the work is there. I just found resources, whatever. Um, like you do that and then you're erased, you're gone. You, you, you can't do that. Right. And then you're hyper visible and then there's the attacks, there's the whatever. And then there's, oh, you're like on the press, whatever. So here are these, the real power is here are these people. You don't know their names. You don't know who they are. You don't know they're, they're not accountable to anything. They don't get any attacks, whatever. They have that hundred million dollars, something or another. So, you know, that's irritating, but I still think, you know, I think it's, it's kind of the kinds of things you say, like, uh, um, uh, you know, how how these little, small, different distributed um, coalitions or whatever, you know, you build your small thing, I build my small thing, somebody else builds their small thing, we can kind of like support each other, whatever, and that's people power, right? I mean, and then that's how you go up against the whatever hundreds of millions of dollars thing. But it's still an issue because, you know, what I want to do is funnel resources to certain groups of people, to certain people, right? And like, you're trying to make that legible to like the funders and kind of like, you know, write your <laughs> things in a way that they'll like. And that, you know, power dynamic is also super weird. Sometimes, you know, like the some of the funders that supported us in the beginning, like Ford, MacArthur, that was really great because they really just supported the vision and that's it. Um, yeah. But then when you're applying for like these project based things and I'm worried then I'm like, am I going to are we going to try to like steer our whatever we're doing to that agenda so that we get that money? There is a danger of that. Right. So it's just you're right. It's super stressful. I'm also starting to like feel stressed. But that is those are the things that, you know, are constantly on our minds. No, thank you for the generosity of both of you. I feel like this conversation is so real. And part of it, I'm just always reminded of Toni Morrison's um, quote, and I think Olufemi Taiwo in the beginning of reconsidering reparations brings this up too, about how much racism is a distraction. You know, they say you have no history, so you spend all this time proving you had history, et cetera. And because we can have this intramural conversation where we don't have to reassert these basic claims about our own humanity, this like alleviates certain kinds of pressures and allows us to have different kinds of conversations and this question around funding, it just reminded me of two things. One is I really love Eric Foner's work on reconstruction, although like shame on him, he's always like bashing the Columbia Graduate Student Union. Um, but it's a shame because his scholarship is really good. And I love that um, he really, in the 80s, he relied on these primary s- sources. And what he showed was the diary entries of these white wives of Northern abolitionists who after the Civil War were so happy that slavery was over because they felt like it was a sin and an affront to their white Christianity. And then they proceeded to go down south uh, because now they were like, you know, black people, they can become citizens now. So they're they're currently savages because they were enslaved. And so we're ready to, you know, teach them and prepare them to enter American citizenship. 
And they're just so confused in these diary entries. They're like these black people. They want to teach their own schools. Can you believe it? Like, they want to teach their own kids. They're using some made-up curriculum, and we're here to save them. Like, what are they doing, right? And so then I recently read this book by Jarvis R. Givens, Fugitive Pedagogy. And it's taking, it's like taking another critical relook at Carter G. Woodson. Really love this book, highly recommend it, because I think it's making an important intervention around the question of respectability politics. Because a lot of critical black studies has kind of discarded that generation, that kind of like two generations post-slavery of like teaching institutions. And, you know, these were the laboratories in which um, you know, the black radical tradition was born out of the civil rights movement, the anti-lynching movement, where it happened in these classrooms, right? And a lot of what Woodson talks about is these black associations, both professional and personal associations, to mentor the next generation, to share resources. And so these questions for funding are not like just about career stability. Yes, they're like about economic precarity, something that I've also experienced, but it's about these white supremacist institutions have figured the individual as the like bearer of knowledge and like the mechanism of inquiry and that's just so counter to kind of the the cultural context that a lot of us come out of right like i really love what you said timnit about wanting to support like refugee advocates who understand a lot about social media and that makes sense right because you can't begin from the technology the technology is augmenting pre-existing kind of social catastrophes and histories. And as somebody rooted in that context that gets it, it's not like we just want to be nice people. I mean, like, I think I'm great and everything, but it's not, I'm not inherently a good person. It's not that I just want to help people, but it's about like, we can't actually get free if there's just a handful of us becoming socially mobile, right? Yeah, yeah. And to your earlier question about like the activist versus researcher, I mean, I think activists is what they say when they can't use the hard R, right? Because it's really a question about your social positioning, you know? And if you're not going with the status quo, which we can't on the basis of our own standpoint, unless we, you know, revert into a single consciousness where we just take on the, the like, hegemonic culture, we're always going to be at odds. We're always labeled an activist. Um, and I guess... The last thing I just wanted to say on that is, you know, with the exception of Simone Brown's Dark Matters, I still don't feel like there's a real reckoning with the centrality of slavery, especially transatlantic and chattel slavery and how that relates to technology. Yeah. They are pending these little ethic courses on there. But coloniality is like, you know, something you put alongside the social yeah. justice platitude for the fact brochure. Like it hasn't quite like penetrated. And, you know, what... To me, I think structurally there's a question, is facts going to just absorb into the center a handful of academics from other fields, or are there going to be resources pushed out to like subsidize like ongoing interdisciplinary research? Um, I could say a lot more, but I, I want to be mindful of time. So I'm going to ask you each one more question, and then I want to take some <laughs> questions from the audience. <laughs> um, not, not to like rule by fiat here. Um, but one, one question I had for you, Timnit, is in the aftermath of your deeply egregious and public firing or resignating by Google, how are you continuing this research around large language models? How do you situate the questions around tech labor in relationship to the ecological and political critiques you made of LL LLMs in the Stochastic Parrots paper? Um, and for you, Sophia, my question was in your ACM Interactions article, the logics of digital distortion, you stated without any clearly stated values governing the content moderation and algorithmically amplified outcomes of their products, big tech, particularly social media and search engines, has collapsed any coherent understanding of democracy and civil rights. So can you elaborate on how civil rights and affirmative action um, in the US has come under algorithmic attack? And so either order, um, yeah, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, I can I can really quickly um, talk about this um, in terms of right all of the issues that you talked about in um, uh, my research in la large language models. I actually want to do more. So what one of the things that I'd like um, dare to focus on is make sure that we don't just put out academic papers and move on. Like think about you know how do we communicate different results um, to different people? Like who who do we want to reach with this work, and how do we want to communicate it? And what I want to do more with this um, research on large language models is find different ways to communicate the results to different groups of people because this this discourse has, you know, just like there are a lot of people talking about policy around large language models, and it's not. To me, it's not the group that I'd want to influence that policy. So I'd like to get 
that conversation to at least a point um, like where we are with face recognition kind of discourse, right? I mean, I think five years ago, um, there wasn't that much conversation about face recognition and, you know, banning it, uh, regulation, this, that. Um, and now there's like a whole bunch of people talking about it. With large language models, um, we are not, we just haven't even started really having the conversation. So in terms of the next phase of my research, that's what I want. Um, that's what I want to do. Um, but, it, you know, the, the, like, I think it's it's kind of merging with this um, other research that we're doing on social media, but because the the speed with which and the scale at which you can produce all sorts of stuff with these large language models uh, combined with social media and like it's, it's very scary to me, right? Um, and so, yeah, but, but I just like, what I want to do next with just that line of work is really just figure out how to, you know, kind of get a lot of people involved in that conversation. Just tied again. <laughs> okay, so part of what I think um, is at stake right now is that we truly understand the speed and scale by which so many different kinds of technologies, not just the big tech companies that are household names, but for sure them, and a variety of other kinds of technologies that are coming to ex into existence that are being deployed, no oversight, no one even knows until after um, people are harmed and we're able to talk about it and we have a lot of evidence of harm. That to me is the project. And so when in the Logic Magazine um, uh, piece or in the ACM piece um, that and Sarah and I are writing about that the tech companies have no real um, accountability to things like civil rights or democracy or human rights or sovereign rights. Those are not even part of the project, so much so that the critical infrastructure that upholds the United States um, is the same critical infrastructure technology that is sold to people who would be um, in, interested and in, invested in taking down the critical infrastructure of the United States, right? So you have this like tension between what the companies are doing um, for the highest bidder, for anyone who will pay to play and engage and that stands in deep contradiction with other kinds of value systems. And so much so that we don't even have a legibility anymore around things like the values of civil rights, the values of sovereign rights, the value of human rights, the value of um, multiracial democracy and the possibilities for it, because the um, speed and scale by which propaganda, um, anti-democratic, fascist, other white supremacists, other kinds of um, um, ideas about how to organize the world um, um, are able to be propagated so much faster. And in fact, those ideas are more profitable, right? The, the racist, this is the thing that we work on every day, is that the racist, um, anti-democratic kinds of material that move about and um, and um, experiments that are deployed and um, new regimes of power that are erected are incredibly profitable to a small handful of people in the world. And you know, this is one of the things that I really try to stress at the end of Algorithms of Oppression, which is that we have more tech and more data than ever, and we have more global inequality and injustice, socially, politically, and economically, to go with it. So this is the um, the assignment is to understand how that is happening, which really has very little to do with any of us as individually as actors. You know, you, me, the, the, any of the three of us, we're trying to make that visible with our work and our colleagues are doing that. And so, the, you know, yeah, of course, it goes back to this question of will we have a cottage industry of people who... Um, you know, try to critique and pick pick apart each other's work. And, you know, that's like actually the only project. 
or is the project to try to make legible these issues so that we don't see a further collapsing of models and ways of thinking about freedom and um, high quality of life and um, human agency and the possibility of making the worlds we want to live in. And, you know, this is where I will just go back to your kind of early provocation, Khadija, which is thinking about Jarvis's new book, which I just met him this week. And I was like, ah, hi, hi. Um, so I met him at Berkeley um, this week. But I will say that, you know, those localized um, associations, you know, the improvement associations, like the era of the improvement association. I live in a historically black neighborhood in LA and we actually still have an improvement association. And it is like the dopest thing ever to me. Um, because I think a lot of this, um, like, uh, concern for protecting each other, understanding what's happening around us, um, um, investing in each other, the care for each other, that is also happens locally. You know, everyone's waiting for a savior in these conversations. The savior's not me. The savior's not the two of you. We're not the saviors. We're the canaries in the coal mine, like Black women always are, right? About harms and anti-democratic and like unjust um, laws and practices and customs in the world. What we're trying to do is say everyone has to actually care right where you are and the resistance to the harm will happen right where we are um, through our working together. These technologies are about um, fracturing us from those possibilities and those solidarities and those ways of doing community work. I always tell my husband, I'm like, you know, from when I hit the lottery, I just want to pee. I want to like paint all the houses for all of the elders in our neighborhood. Like, I just want to let them have an, a beautiful space. And no, that seems like ridiculous, but I understand like yeah. improving, you know, the property value and like that um, psychologically and economically there's value in like reinvesting each other. That is like my own little version of like democracy building in my neighborhood. Yeah, I know yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. I totally understand what you mean. You know what I mean? But it's like, it's like the love and the possibilities get to be expressed in many, many different ways. They will happen at the level of regulation, like you're talking about of the tech sector. I mean, I feel like I'm loving the world every day by trying to work on that, but they'll also happen in our rejecting the ring door bells that are about surveilling each other in our neighborhoods and, and fostering, you know, a, a sentiment of distrust. Um, so there's lots of ways in which I think artists, um, people who aren't technologists, parents, um, everybody can participate in these projects and in these conversations, which is really about resisting this idea of hyper fragmentation, distrust, surveillance, um, and loss of human agency and possibility. You know, can I tell you that um, the only time I've ever bought a lottery ticket <clears throat> was with my mom. And uh, she was like, can you can you buy this lottery ticket? I'm like, mom, look, the probability of you, you know, I just went through the spiel. She's like, it's it doesn't matter, like someone wins it. So it was during COVID, like we had to, um, you know, we, we went to the gas station. She's like, here's here's the, the, the you know, convenience store go buy it. I'm like, okay, you know, I'll double mask, whatever. I was trying to like <laughs> talk her out of it. And I asked her like, why do you want, like, what will you do with, with the lottery? Like uh, take it, if you win, what would you do? She was like, I would um, create something like the Nobel prize for people in East Africa, for Ethiopians and Eritreans, like who have, you know, all uh, like potential, but they don't have any resources. They don't have money. Like, you know, that's what I would do. That's what she told me, you know, and, and it's kind of similar to the kinds of things you were saying, right? Like that she wasn't like, well, I'd give it to all my, you know, kids or whatever. And she was like, that's, that's what I want to do. And I, I'm the, you know, if I won, <laughs> if I won the lottery. Love your mom. <laughs> Thank you. The funny thing about the Nobel Peace Prize is, do you know the story behind Nobel, that? Not, not Nobel Peace Prize. Just, an, mm. uh, just she was kind of saying, like, you know, I'd, I'd establish a fund. She was kind of saying, like, the, you know, but no, I don't know the story behind it. I, I anticipate it's not a good one, is it? So, I mean, white dude, right? So his famous invention was dynamite. <laughs> and so uh, his brother had died and the newspapers thought it was him. 
And so he saw an obituary for himself while he was alive saying that he was a war criminal because, you know, dynamite's primary purpose was a weapon of war and it caused mass civilian casualties. And he was like, my legacy cannot be war criminal. And so that's why he invented, that was like what animated him to create the Nobel Peace Prize to have a different legacy, right? Um, So I want to... I want to read a question from the chat, uh, and I'm just going to like add my two cents to it. So the question is, what changes do you think would be necessary in tech in order to facilitate the kind of community building necessary for transformative justice? Um, I love this question, and I just wanted to add an element about transnationalism, which I feel like is both a moral commitment and very challenging. Because on one hand, we have um, like Caitlin Rosenthal's accounting of slavery discusses how the scientific like worker management techniques developed on the plantation are now implemented by Amazon. Yet the critique of Bezos fails to recognize that he's like a plantation owner. Right. And so but at the same time, we need this transnational, but there's not even a depth domestically. But I know, you know, you and I, Tim, have been thinking a lot about the Tigrayan genocide and like, you know, what are these black diasporic? connections. And so, um, yeah, this question about community building necessary for transformative justice in tech. Well, I'm going to jump in on this because I think part of the transformative justice um, paradigm for tech is that we have to actually understand that the tech sector in the way that we understand it in the West is um, predicated upon colonization, you know, exploitation of workers in the supply chain that that uh, must be, be kept intact in order to, you know, extract minerals, uh, manufacture, um, consume, distribute and consume, and then, you know, uh, generate waste that has to go somewhere, right? And so the environmental effects of this are profound, we know, but also um, the global politics, economic politics of the sector has to be uh, really brought into view because most people probably who are watching this on YouTube have never thought about where the minerals come that are in their devices that they're watching this, this talk on. And if we had to account for the transnational politics of the tech sector, we would actually be having very, very different conversations about what's important and what we're not going to reproduce, right, from, let's say, earlier industries like um, the automotive industry that was reliant upon, you know, the extraction of rubber, um, right, in the Congo and um, the uh, atrocious you know, devastating politics that surrounded that, that got articulated as even for black people in the United States is like a particular type of freedom, because we know that the automobile created a different kind of freedom and accessibility and protection for black people um, who previously did not have access to cars. So we have to do this kind of, this is where the value of like pan-Africanist um, ways of thinking about the tech sector are so incredibly important. And, um, you know, it's in the production of social media content, but it's also in the making of hardware and software. So I think that's, you know, um, part of the transformative conversation, the transformative justice conversation. It cannot just be like what's good for people in the United States or Europe, full yeah. stop. That's that's just unacceptable. And of course, we have to look at places where we have democracy being threatened, um, you know, India, other places um, that are very, very important, um, where authoritarian regimes are um, um, uh, crisis inducing in their in the way in their ways of um, operating their suppression of uh voices of women journalists of you know a whole number of things so um and they're kind of um you know uh racist you know and and kind of ethnically um chauvinistic ways of of moving that are incredibly dangerous and we see this in many different kinds of countries um right now so i think these are part of the ways in which we have to think about transformative justice it's like and those things are happening locally and of course they're connected globally have you seen the tech fog investigation by the wire? Um, it's an Indian um, news um, paper. Oh man, 
It's like, yeah, that uh, it's three parts. Um, I think they also have a video. I read part one. I'm going to read part two and three. It's all about how, uh, you know, the party, the is um, the, the ruling party is using all sorts of sophisticated methodology and social media to suppress all sorts of um, people, including, um, you know, like, for instance, they'd create burner accounts really quickly that you can't detect, like create them and close them, just all sorts of tactics. And it's it's just um, it's very scary. Yeah, it's kind of um, but I, I, I really I totally agree. I mean, we have to have uh, not just a U.S. centric view. And that's really hard when you come to the U.S. I mean, I remember when I when I came in ninety nine, um, I felt like I entered a black hole, like that where things didn't enter from other places. Like, you know, I didn't really, I couldn't get news um, of, of what was happening outside of the US. Like I um, I remember at least, you know, even in, in Europe, I could, they, we would still hear about the war, like Ethiopian Eritrean war that we escaped, right? But they were very much concerned about Kosovo. They weren't thinking about, you know, like anything, uh, there but so then you come to the states i i feel like we're uh, like it's a very kind of self-contained kind of um thing so it's very important to to have um you know to work with people who are also there is other issue also where you can get involved in an issue that you don't really know as much about and so then you can like start doing the wrong thing too right so it's like really important to spend our time uh, working with members of other communities who know what's going on so that like I'm always scared of jumping because I see people doing that in stuff that I know like jumping in and like you know being uh, 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 up in arms about the wrong thing right and so because they're hearing from their friends in one location or whatever and so they think now they can advocate on behalf because they know something so it's it's I think it's 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 a bit hard because of that but um but it's it's really, really important because we see, you know, some of these things before way before they come close to Europe or, or the US or whatever, you see them happening. Um, and it's like so hard to get anybody to care about it, right? Like Tigray, for instance, I remember Khadija and I and Mahdi were having a meeting about it, like, well, right before I got fired um, from Google, right? And it was just like you know, it's a bit on the news now, but it's it's absolutely not commiserate with with the amount of destruction that's happening. These are like I know specifically people who are an unaccounted for. I know people whose homes were raided. I know people who are hiding right now. Like, um, I mean, actually, some of them might be out, but like and and we have to just kind of also just somehow pretend like there's a way f that w in which you have to also just carry on with like your job or whatever like while well, this is happening you know um so we need to create like a much more global um understanding and view of things and i think that you know not because it will come to your door if we don't if we not just because of that but because i don't know like they're people too right like i don't know i mean it's it's very strange um this 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 just and then I was asked to um, don't like I saw all of the tech um, platforms like Gmail or or Twitter or something. And they're like, do you want to donate to Ukraine? I'm like, Sh you know, that's great that you're you're asking me to do that. But I mean, like, honestly, just got so angry. I'm like, are you kidding me? Why can't we, you know, have this kind of um, attitude about like the refugees that are coming out of Tigray, the, the ones that are being trafficked in Libya, like every day we're, the other day, I just called a, um, a poor kid who was with the traffickers, right? Like, because they were asking for ransom. And so w why is it so hard to, to have some amount of compassion um, for people like that? And I think it's literally rooted in the assumption that black people are supposed to go through that, that that's supposed to be like a, a normal thing for, for them to go through, right? It's not normal in Ukraine because um, you're seeing white people going through it. But um, yeah, I think this is a very important part of the conversation. Um, I mean, we see how, uh, like, I don't know, I'm sure you read the, the time piece about um, uh, content moderators for Sama, uh, for, uh, for Facebook, right? 
in um, in Kenya. Um, there's other articles about how like there are other data annotators there in those refugee camps too for self-driving cars and things like that. So um, if we don't have that global view, we miss all of these kinds of issues. Yeah, I think part of it is like the depths of settler colonialism in the US and like the ongoingness of it. Because as someone who sits in the diaspora, like I, out of my family, most of them speak four languages, at least like Afana Roma, Amharic, Arabic, and English. And here I am like monolingual. Um, and part of it is not just that I live in the US, but you think like the United States, like geographically is huge compared to yeah. like most of Western Europe, right? Yeah. And like the, the, the erasure and the like subjugation, I mean like, People speak another language or come here as kids and don't speak English and get placed into special education and labeled as developmentally disabled. And they will like rob you of the ability yeah. to speak that language. Like you come and here have and have that connection, um, right? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And they just, they shame, they shame you. If you speak the language, they really encourage you to teach your kids only English so that they can assimilate into this Americanness, like I even see when I was growing up, I think like kinship was a much more like decentralized proposition and like your aunts were just involved in your life as your mother and et cetera. And I see now like a shift more towards like nuclear family, like, mm. you know, these kind of yeah. very Americana values that like reorganize society. And I think that's part of this landlocked into the US mentality within tech research. And then yeah. also this Orientalism which is like both also goes to Africa, right? This yeah. idea that there's like these kind of primordial savages who just have ethnic conflict. Like that's part of All what the it time. means that's to be African. Yeah. yeah, like the majority of coverage and even like, you know, uh, what is it, rest of world, like the analysis they'll do about Rohingya or about Tigray. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, just body counts, you know, like. Yeah. Some acronyms group over here killed some acronyms group over there, but there's the, the assumption is these are people without histories. And I think we have to care because it's coming here because it's like morally right, but also we are of this, you yeah. know, this idea that we're all these discrete atomized like individuals and not a society is just like <laughs> distort, like detached from reality. Um, we have like five minutes left, so I do want to ask one more question from the chat, and I really thank you, th thank you guys for your 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 generosity with your commentary and also to the AKA audience for giving such long answers to the questions. <laughs> no, but your answers are dope. You know, like on one level, there's too many panels all the time, but on the other hand, it's not like the conversation we're having here is like a rehearsed one that everyone yeah. has heard a hundred times, right? Like. This to me is the direction that I want to go in and like the kind of community I want to build. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a question here from Aviana. What is the possibility of mutual aid as funding in the absence of legibility of knowledge production in tech? Which I also love because I think there's a question for me about mutual aid. Like is mutual aid going to always rely on privatized peer to peer cash exchange? Right. And what does that mean when we saw after Gaza and people are sending money to the Palestinians and also probably don't write Palestinian in your uh, notes yeah. as you're sending it, that the, the funding was getting suspended. Right. And so relying on these things becomes complicated. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll very quickly go, but I think um, Safia might have a lot to say because you have, you know, the equity engine that you, you just built that's uh, about that. Um, so, um, yeah, like in our communities, I mean, um, especially being an immigrant, there's always a lot of mutual aid. You're, you're sending money to this group or, you know, you're like organizing against certain, uh, uh, you know, around certain things. But yeah, like um, when we're, um, sending money, um, it, it's very difficult to get, like, let's say have a foundation money and have that go, go to these kinds of things. And, um, I, uh, don't, <laughs> I can't, I, I don't, I don't know how to do that except for, uh, the way in which I was, um, telling you earlier, Khadija. So for instance, Merona Stefanos, who you might know is, is like a, a huge refugee advocate and she's, helped like more than 16,000 refugees. I'm talking about like people, I mean, it's just a lot we can say about her, but like literally people would be on a boat and, you know, about to sink and say, there's 800 of us here. Our lives are in your hands, you know, like not as no single human being should, should have that kind of weight. Right. But so she's been doing this for decades. Um, 
And on the one hand, she has all of these government attacks and this and this. On the other hand, there's all these people being like, oh, she's getting, you know, press time, whatever. But like nobody's really thinking about like this one person who's doing all this stuff for her community who needs to also, you know, have some amount of support and protection, etc. So, right. Like, so I was, I was thinking, OK, how can how can I sup make sure that we can have resources funneled to her. I can't just say like, oh, hey, here's this like really important person. We should support that foundation money goes there. You have to figure out how to make, you know, like your support for that person legible. So yes, you know, this is the kind of expertise she brings to these projects that we're working on. This is the kind of expertise that she brings to these other projects that we're working on. This is um, why we need to have someone like this in our institute and so this is how we're gonna have funding you know for her so those kinds of things i i think i can you know figure out how to do it but there's other ways in which um like i can't i i don't understand how we can put like that that foundation money there or here like you know like for instance the refugees in libya like i don't know how we would be able to you know funnel that money oh i i, I figured um some ways that i figured um how to do that is for instance, for instance you might be able to invite them like to um some you know when you have these panels or these um, conferences or something and you can give them an honorarium but the way in which we pay um a lot of times when we send money to these uh, uh, to people, it's not through banks and stuff like there is. Well, anyways, um, uh, an another system. Right. So I can't get that foundation money to go um, to them like that. But this shows you. Yeah, we're always thinking about ways of funneling, you know, resources and, and how to do it properly. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's like all of these kinds of issues and certainly, you know, my own kind of effort to have a nonprofit is to help people um, accelerate their projects and their ideas and be supported in them. I think I also spend, a, you know, a reasonable amount of time really trying to push the boundaries of the way that we think about mutual aid and it's and the necessity of it because we have such incredible wealth consolidation in the world in the hands of a few. And I think that has to also be part of our conversation. So for me, I have really spent a lot of time talking about what does it mean for me as a state employee, a University of California professor working in, at UCLA at a, in a system that is only 4% funded by taxpayers now, which makes the system wow. really precarious and reliant upon private donors, um, federal and state funding. Um, and that is happening in the state that gave birth to Silicon Valley and now Silicon Beach, which one would imagine that the system and the public good and all of the public institutions from which our children can get an affordable education and affordable college degrees and, you know, and have public sector jobs and all kinds of things that would make the world better in many ways. One would think that California would be that have the number one GDP in the world, just the state of California because of Silicon Valley and Silicon beach, because those companies pay taxes. But in fact, it's actually an inverse where this, the, um, the fragility of the public sector and the public good is laid bare by the fact that Silicon Valley doesn't pay taxes. For the most part, they offshore their profits and um, they 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 scam the public. They off you know they offload most of their risky investment to the public to taxpayers. They use our public infrastructure, our roads, our airports, all of the things. They cream they take the cream of the crop of the best students and then they um, give nothing back for the most part, into society, except extractive solutions and products. So I think we have to think about mutual aid at scale. And part of the way that we do that is thinking about the richest industry on planet Earth. Seven of the 10 most well-capitalized countries on the planet are tech companies. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it that they can create the conditions of scarcity such that we have the kinds of um, concerns that we've been talking about for the last, you know, 20 minutes or so. So to me, there's like this, this is like the structural dimension. Um, because of course, we know black women, we're always passing back and forth the same $20 to, <laughs> to our girlfriends to make sure everybody good. You know what I'm saying? So like, that's, that's part of the ethos of how we live. But then there's this, these other dimensions of like, what is the responsibility 
of the social structure to ensure that there is um, um, a system that makes sense. And, you know, this is to me where um, a lot of my focus also, you know, lives. Well, I can't believe it, but we've spoken for 92 minutes. <laughs> so unfortunately, we're going to have to come to a close. But I really, I really like just appreciate this conversation. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Love seeing you. Always. Me too.